What is up, everybody? You are checking out the Uncensored Pro Wrestling Podcast. I am your host, Ant, and I am joined by my friend and co-host. Introduce yourself, brother. What's going on? It's Josh from uh, Sharpshooters and Stunners Podcast. Uh, glad to be back here with you, man. Doesn't he have such a nice, relaxing, calm, listen to your car voice as you're listening to Sharpshooters and Stunners, you know, hearing the weekly recap. You know, it's a nice, calming, cool thing to listen. I've definitely have been listening to it and give it a five star rating on Spotify and wherever. You guys have a lot of like good takes and funny thoughts. So check it out, Thank motherfuckers. You. Um, so we are covering um well, you're checking out the attitude years, obviously, um, our series, and we both have our raw as war backgrounds. If you're listening to us on Spotify, Anchor, Google Podcasts. Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, wherever podcasts are available. Think about checking us out on YouTube because you get to see our faces and this beautiful background that we both got here. Our Raw is War logo is sick. So yeah, do that as well. Check us out on YouTube. So we are now covering the Raw is War episode from March 9th, 1998. They are live in Wheeling, West Virginia. Say that 10 times fast. Uh, and we start off with action right away. We have the Nation of Domination members, the Intercontinental Champion, The Rock, and Farouk with the Nation, taking on the world's most dangerous man, Ken Shamrock, and Steve Blackman, the lethal weapon. Not a lot of action here. The Rock nails a people's elbow to Ken Shamrock. The camera feed messes up during this match, and uh, Blackman drop kicks Rock in the back, gets a roll up, and gets a two count. Farouk nails a power slam and a spin kick. And then the nation attack both men and Mark Henry drops Steve Blackman across the railing. And then the rock tells the nation, I want Ken Shamrock to myself. You guys leave. And after he says that, Ken Shamrock nails Farouk with a belly to belly. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, then, and then the nation's like, oh shit, we better go help. And Farouk's like, nah, he said, let him do it. Farouk pulls the nation back. That's when Shamrock applies the ankle lock, and uh, uh, he's outside of the ring applying the ankle lock to The Rock, and The Rock taps out, but um, the referee pulls Ken Shamrock off of him. The ref n- announces that Ken Shamrock and Steve Blackman win by his qualification because Mark Henry got involved, but I feel like they should have announced it earlier. <laughs> it's like that yeah. it continues yeah. on, and then it's like, you're winners <laughs> if you don't remember. Um, so what did you think of this whole entire Farouk rock angle? Because it's it's now getting interfering in matches, and the rock is now actually getting hurt because of it. I thoroughly enjoy where it's going. It's Farouk is still trying to, he's that old dog trying to still assert his dominance and assert that you know he's still the leader of the pack, so he lets the young buck that's on the come up fend for himself so nobody else it's a very easy story to tell and it's it's simple but uh executed very well what i the only thing that i wish they did um a bit better was sort of um like i don't want to say explain but like they they don't they show that the rocks being annoying but they don't show like they show the rock is trying to like step up and be the leader and everything like that. And Farouk is looking at him and like, what the hell, man? But like, no, nah, I guess I can't really complain because he has. So I was going to say, like, how does the rock show that he wants to be the leader? But he does because he fucking. <laughs> I, I wish I wish they showed him more um, undermining. Farouk's authority a little bit more yeah. like like the 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 biggest thing that I always remember is remember the I don't I don't I think this was a raw but Farouk's cutting a promo and the rock standing in front and he's just rolling his eyes and looking off to the side and I wish they did more of that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I agree that's what I was trying to, like they they did show that he wanted to be but you're right like they didn't show him like undermining him more it was just kind of like i'm champion i do remember like the eye rolls and he's like and then he's chewing his gum and he's like Mm. like not that's cool but yeah and also well we'll get there when we get there but 
for those, well, we'll get there. I don't want to spoil anything for those who don't listen. We'll get there. I do have a question about the niche and when we get there. But yeah, I do like this whole um, thing where Farouk is like, all right, fend for yourself now, man. Like, you know, you told us to leave. Let's do mm-hmm. it. And, you know, he can't easily say to The Rock, you know, that was just a teachable moment for you. I want to see what you could do. You know, you said we want to respect you and listen to your words type thing. <clears throat> yeah. Well, we now have DX coming out and that's just Triple H and China. And they trash talk Owen Hart. Uh, we then see Shawn Michaels on the Titan Tron live in Texas. And Shawn Michaels says Stone Cold is a fad. And I will always be the WWE champion. Sean says, I will treat you like I treat everyone. I don't lay let lay down for anyone. And Steve, I ain't doing it for you. So that's a little blurring lines there because for those who, you know, are no sort of background during this time, Shawn Michaels wasn't really, I don't, I don't want to say he wasn't really, but people have said he didn't really want to lay down for others and drop the belt to people. So they're blurring a little lines there where they're, they're mentioning it, but only people at that time who were really like the sort of like the backstage people and the writers and like dirt cheap people knew this stuff. But, you know, we know they didn't want to lay down for Brett, you know, so, and that just happened. So for him to say that, I, I like how they're pushing the boundaries, but what did mm-hmm. you think about, um, about this promo really not a lot to it i uh i enjoyed this segment um a bit of a foreshadowing for what's going to happen later on in the night um i enjoyed where it went um it it a little bit of a test i guess you could say for triple h at the time he's getting a lot more uh mic work on his own because in a few weeks we all know he's going to be the guy of that that group so um i thought it was great all around and it you kind of lays the groundwork for what happens later on in the night yes sir yes sir um triple h then joins commentary because we have the european title on the line the champion owen hart defending against barry windham with james e Cornette. now just for um, story sake, we know last week when Owen Hart was defending against Mark Henry, China got involved, and uh, you know she made sure that Owen Hart kept that title leading up to WrestleMania, where he's supposed to take on Triple H. So the match starts, and technical difficulties continue on. At this point in the first match, I was like, "Oh, something you know was weird." Now I know that something's going on; that this is all planned. I forgot all of this stuff happened until I watched it back again. Like the first time, the the first when it happened in the first match, I was like, "Well, that's kind of weird." That was me and the too. second, like, and the second match, I was like, "Oh, I know where this is going now." <laughs> yeah, because I remember I was like, you know, I. Oh, I also forgot to mention. So the European title is on the line. Did I say that Owen Hart defending against Barry? Yes. Um, okay, I did say that. Okay, good. So Barry nails a clothesline and gets a two count. Owen backdrops Barry to the outside, and then he send he being Owen sends Barry into the ring steps. China can, then comes down and low blows Owen Hart, and Owen gets counted out, and Barry Windham wins by count out. However, Owen Hart retains the title after the match. Bradshaw ran down and attacked Barry Windham, and Barry is a former partner of Bradshaw. So, what do you think of this whole storyline of China? Pretty much getting involved in these matches to help Triple H to ensure that Owens champion. I think it tells a great story. Um, you know, obviously the, the match at mania doesn't really mean anything to Triple H if Owens, not the European champion, Yeah, you know, cause that's really all that Triple H at this point cares about is getting that title back. So I think it tells a great story. Um, also in this match, if you, if you saw, Owen Hart rolled the shit out of his ankle. Yeah, he, he did. And as a person who has broken both of his ankles, that yeah, nothing yeah. makes uh, nothing makes me wince like seeing somebody roll their ankle. Uh, and and so that you think he was obviously fighting with the injury with the with the hurt ankle and everything. Yeah, like uh, rumor is that he was wearing uh, going fast forward to Mania. He was wearing the uh, walking boot 
up until like right before he walks through the curtain. Oh, shit. I mean, uh, in all honesty, he probably shouldn't have competed at WrestleMania. Oh. And today, by today's standards, he wouldn't. He probably wouldn't have competed today. Well, that's some background shit that I didn't know. At what point did he do this? Was this after? Um... This was uh, about a minute before uh, the low blow. Okay, so this. Okay, so so he didn't have to work much longer after it. No, no. Okay, okay. But God, he worked mania. Damn. Well, yeah. And then what about Bradshaw? You care much about this whole Bradshaw Barry Windham situation? I mean, it really ends up because really- not really because it was on and off. Like yeah. Yeah. It, like they hadn't shown anything with the, those two for a few weeks and then all of a sudden it's back they're back on yeah uh, I, I actually i actually enjoyed the the uh blackjacks team i thought that was it was a different team it yeah. wasn't your nor your typical it wasn't it wasn't the smoking guns you know what i mean it was a badass cow two cowboys that looked the part i just think at that time wwe wasn't really invested in the tag team division yeah you're right we've talked about that yeah i i agree like they look different they had like the, the mustache and and you know they they looked like big tough cowboys you know well we come back and we learned that raw is brought to us by 10 3 21 wwf the music value 2 which i know my brother had and wwf legend series at toys r us bringing us back um we then get a backstage interview from Kane and Paul Bearer. Paul says that Kane destroyed Vader. While Paul Bearer is talking, cha- chairs start to open and close, like the little benches start to open backstage. And he's like, Paul Bearer is kind of freaking out. And he's like, oh, nothing's going on. Everything's okay. Like, you know, but you can tell he's getting nervous. Um, obviously, you know, a smart fan's going to know that this has some kind of connection to the camera fees cutting out earlier. What do you think of this promo? It was a kind of funny, silly promo. It was it was funny. I love the fact that Paul Bears every time every time the pounding starts, he looks at King, gets set, tells him to stop it. Yeah, I feel um, like King is the one doing it. Yeah, it's one of those things when you're watching that as a kid, you're like, how 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 are they doing this? Like, how are listen? I know it's really dumb, but how are they doing it? I I'm I'm assuming they had um they just put some sort of like motor or some like hydraulic thing or maybe even the just just a, a a pressure system like it does it a hydraulic system to make those lift isn't isn't too um and the, listen I was, they're, cool. I was they're, looking for like a little line I'm like where is it they had a guy I've heard Bruce Pritchard talk a lot about Richie Richie Posner who's done a lot of great things with props back in the day and it's it's one of those things that like they don't he's done he's done magic before with like how how they were able to bury undertaker alive but not bury undertaker alive and stuff like that yeah um i'm I'm sure he had something to do with this but it was real interesting that's cool yeah cool to kind of see you know the background on that because i too i was like looking at i'm like wait how did that you know as an adult too i'm like how does that happen um Cool though, very cool. I mean, and obviously, whoever did it, if it is this guy, is phenomenal. Because as a 29 year old, I'm saying, you're like, how did that happen? Um, very cool. <laughs> okay, next we have Aguila with the light heavyweight champion Taka Mishinoku taking on Brian Christopher with Jerry the King Lawler during the match. There's thunder and lightning, which you know, should say in the fan. Aguila nails a missile drop kick to the back of Christopher's head. Taka pulls the king off the apron, who King is on the apron trying to distract. And then King sends Taka into the steps. Aguila goes to the top, but King pulls him down. Aguila wins the disqualification. And then after Brian Christopher power bombs Aguila. So, oh, and then after that, Taka drop kicks Brian Christopher off the apron onto the king. I have a question. What I don't understand is why didn't they do this Taka storyline with Brian Christopher into Mania? Um, I don't remember. Did they not? Did they not face each other in Mania? I, did, I'm not. He fights Aguila at Mania. Uh, <clears throat> I, I'm not a hundred percent certain. It might. It could have had something to do with Taka's 
dates over at Michinoku Pro in Japan. Um, because I know he was going back and forth, so he might not have been available for Mania. Well, he fought at Mania. He fought. Oh, did he? Ag- yeah, he fought. Oh, Ag- Taka fought Aguilar. Yeah. yeah, you mean Brian? Bri- yeah. Okay, so uh, maybe Brian just was. You know, maybe they thought they they've done it too long. I'm just wondering because probably. right now, like they're doing, like they're Aguilar and Taka are working together. And, you know, I could be wrong, but I don't think leading up to it, there's any sort of, like, issue between the two of them. But clearly there's issues with Brian and, and Takas, I'm wondering. Or they could have even, I'm surprised they didn't do a tag match with King and Brian against Taka and Aguilar. Yeah, I I don't know if there was an issue. I always thought that Brian Christopher was a very talented performer. Yeah. Yeah, but I I think he had a lot of personal issues that kind of handicapped him. Yeah. You know, there's a difference between if you're Shawn Michaels having personal issues and if you're Brian Christopher having personal issues. Shawn Michaels is proven to be a guy who can have his personal issues but still go out there and perform. And I don't know if WWE really thought that Brian Christopher had his shit well enough together that he can kind of separate the two. You know. Sure. I got to ask you something. This is, and the viewers keep listening and, and, and everything because that this doesn't revolve around 1998. But something because you talked about, um, you know, personal issues and stuff, you heard this whole Jordan Grace thing mm-hmm. with uh, Chris Benoit. What's your take on that? Quick. My take is like, I listen, I like dark humor as much as the next person. It, it, my only issue is with something like that. And I usually, I usually avoid, I think when you're in the industry, I'm looking at it on the side of Benoit's son, his, his living son, right? This is a, this is a guy that's trying to get into the wrestling business who admires the people in the wrestling business. When you make those kind of comments on social media, what are you doing to the psyche of that kid who has nothing to do with what, with what his father did other than the fact that it was his father? Yeah. You know, he, he, he admires everybody in the wrestling business. and He's probably never going to get a fair shot in the wrestling business. Yeah. And, but to have people that he looks up to in the industry make these kind of posts, it, I think it's one thing if a fan does it, but it's it's another thing when you're in the industry and you're trying to get into that industry and you see that everywhere, it it kind of hits different. Yeah, I I've always been um, when it comes to Chris Benoit. Um, you know, and even this is something that I don't think I shared on air. I was I was having a situation where my former coach and I were juggling if, you know, if we should cover over the edge. And I am the type of person where, you know, I with with Chris Benoit, I have to try to separate him like as like a human and his athletic ability in the ring. I've always, always done that. Like when they got rid of him on the DVDs, I thought that was kind of silly. I'm just the person I can for myself separate the two. And I do agree with you on the fact that, you know, there are, he does have a son and the son I bet is probably phenomenal in the ring or could be phenomenal, but won't get a fair a chance. And it's pretty shitty of Dorian Grace to say that too, because it's like, um, like you, you, you're at a certain point now, like you're a champion and you're, you know, all this stuff. And I don't know. I just think don't say, if you have nothing nice to say, don't say anything, you know, like there was it's, no need. It's one of those things like, I, and I'm sure that Benoit's son is in a tough situation where, you know, does he, is he, does he hate his father for what, what happened? Uh, probably, but it's still his father. Yeah. You know, yeah. and yeah. I think it, I don't know. I have a, I have a take on it. Like I said, I like take, dark humor he, and I think it had more to do with, you know, 
her putting it in the line. Uh, the hang. Yeah, the hang in there. That's what I was just about to ask you. Do you think she meant that or do you think she just... I think she did. I think she did mean it. And I don't think it would have been that big of an issue if she just left it at that. You know, because I think it, it... Like I said, I do enjoy dark humor. Yeah. But I think when she ended it with the burn in hell uh remark on the end it's like man, yeah he's got he's got he's got another yeah. kid that has to has to yeah live we're also daily. too you know i think i just feel like and i and i someone said this if you don't think that chris benoit was a good wrestler then you probably are not a, a wrestling fan Mm. because i can clear i can say there are a lot of matches that are my favorites that chris benoit or and chris benoit and angle you know all the fucking tremendous rivalry but of course you know i understand they won't talk about it whatever but i don't know i think like in my honest opinion this is like and, and i could this is just my opinion if you can praise rick flair I mean, like, I know it's, but, like, I know, like, showing yourself and pretty much sexually assaulting someone is completely different than murder, but, I mean, like, I feel like they're very hypocritical. Like, you're not even going to mention, and you don't even have to, I'm not saying even mention Chris Benoit, but, like, Randy Orton, they will never show his first title win, and mm-hmm. that's fucking his first title win. You know, like, there are things that you can do that I think aren't disrespectful to people you know like putting rainy and winning a match against chris Benoit. i mean i don't know what do you think do you think that it was i'm i'm fine with them not going out of their way to glorify mm-hmm. benoit i have my feeling i like i don't go out of my way to say hey benoit I will go, is one of the mm-hmm. best in-ring performers ever like i'm not going to go out of my way to do it but if something comes up to where i have to cover it yeah. you know we'll talk about it but like i i got into this argument a few weeks ago on uh, facebook with a guy who's talking about uh why his hot take was benoit should be in a hall of fame I, how do you how do you glorify somebody's career without going into their personal life and on that stage you know what i mean i think that is where the line is i think you can i think you can glorify their career without it in a, in a simple discussion but to do it on a on a stage like that and put them into a hall of fame is a little much yeah what about well what about someone like a carlos cologne right who i mean we don't know necessarily if he actually did it but technically killed somebody well, he didn't do it. Uh, it was uh, it somewhere. was his prom- yeah. it was his promoter. It was yeah. it was the Booker. You talking about the uh, um, Bruiser Brody Fernandez? thing? Fernandez, yeah. Fernandez, is it Hernandez or Fernandez? Manny Fernandez? No, not Manny Fernandez. Uh, you're you oh, talking Gino about the... Gino? Gino? No, Gino. Gino was a whole whole another thing. Person. It, who the fuck am I? Yeah. Oh, Bruiser Brody. That's who the yeah, fuck Bruiser Brody. Talking. The oh, Bruiser oh. Brody situation. I, don't, I, I, it had something to do with uh, his uh, Carlos Colon's Booker having an issue with Bruiser Brody. I don't think it had anything to really do with Carlos Colon. Now, I agree. I think he. I think Carlos Colon helped, you know, cover it up and get him off of the charges. But I don't think he committed the. Uh, well, yeah, and I said the same thing about like. Um, what about Snooker? Snook, I, I, yeah, that's what I was getting at. Uh, Snooker, yeah. it's a. Here, here's what the, here's the problem with Snooker. Like, there's all kinds of accusations, but there is not any real physical proof. You know what I mean? Like, it's hard to it's hard to justify. Like, we have our the court of public opinion. But that court of public opinion is not is not the law, and I I like I, I I'm able to separate my personal feelings, uh, and the facts pretty well. Like, do I think Snuka probably did? It? Yeah, he probably did. But you can't. Do I have proof that he did? No. I feel you. I feel you. I think. Um, I don't know. 
I don't know. I don't even think there even should be a Hall of Fame, to be quite honest with you, because at this point, they're putting every motherfucker in it. Like, everybody who has done one thing in WWE, come on in. It's a new dog. Well, you know, I, I put it like if somebody asked me this before, and I was like, what they were like, what's the difference between, um, let's say, like, I don't know. Trying to think of somebody who's had a who had a pretty long hall of, a long career in the WWE. But all right, let's go uh, hardcore Holly. Right, mm-hmm. hardcore Holly was in the WWE what like fifteen years, something like that before he finally left. Um, he had a long career, but how many moments can you think of that involved hardcore Holly? True. Well, that's true. Now yeah. you take you take let's say uh rikishi rikishi how many how many moments he had he had a start and stop career in the wwe you know he probably was only there total like eight nine years but at the how many how many memories come to mind of rikishi oh yeah my biggest burden um for me when it came to hall of fame was uh charmel because i felt like i like her i'm glad she went on she looked great she fucking you know did good but you know you made a good point like what did she really i mean for me what did she really contribute she was you know but what's she contributing now she's a big part of reality of wrestling in houston you know are there's a lot of there's a lot of talent in the wwe hall of fame that barely spent any time i wish they would have talked more about that though yeah i like she's she's a huge part of reality wrestling people that have worked with her very closely says they she she champions for you know women having a better role in wrestling and and stuff like that i feel you it's uh it's one of those things where like like i said i'm one of those people that kind of i don't let my personal feelings on what makes a great talent in a Hall of Fame career and stuff fair, like that. To be fair, though, how, like, you, you know, know this stuff, but a, a fan who doesn't know, right, about reality of wrestling, right, has mm-hmm. no clue, yeah. finds out Queen Charmel is in the Hall of Fame, and you're like, well, what the fuck did Queen Charmel do? Um, get bo- worms on her from the boogeyman. But, but at the same time, that that whole that whole persona that booker t that change he went through in what what was that oh six oh seven yeah that reinvigorated his entire career see i felt differently i didn't like that whole thing because if you because then didn't he like leave like a year after yeah and then he went to me i kind of i felt like i felt like it did what it did but like i really i didn't really now I like Booker T more, but I just felt like he was a wannabe rock. Like I felt like the rock was uh, it, maybe just because I grew up with WWE. I just didn't see. I thought he was cool. I loved when he was with Goldust. I thought that mm-hmm. was cool, that pairing. And um, maybe it's because he didn't get enough opportunities to do stuff. But when he did do stuff, he was King Booker. So I get that. I just... I think, in my opinion, I think he's kind of like a, like a nobody in WWE, at least. Like, he was a world champion. He was King Booker. But, like, see, again, I'm more about, like, like I think Rikishi deserves it more than Booker, in my opinion. Because Rikishi did have moments, like, you could talk about. King Booker, yeah, like, when I think of Booker T, I think of Alliance. The first, if you say Booker T, that's the first thing I think of is the alliance. And I think of him being scared of the Undertaker. Like, he's always afraid of somebody. Like, it's like, so it was like, for me, it was kind of like, but as an adult looking at Booker T and seeing, like, that big roundhouse kick and the hype, you know, like, cool-ass crap, you know? But anyways, we went way off. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just wanted to hear your take on that because I know that there was a lot going on um, about it um yeah i didn't i i did hear people talk about like that whole like you know the whole hanging thing and and you know i don't know i don't know but stone Cold steve austin comes out and i know that he comes he comes out and uh 
he calls Mystic Man a yellow bastard. <laughs> uh, Stone Cold says, uh, he will stay out here until Vince McMahon comes out. That's when Gerald Briscoe and Jack Lanza come out. Stone Cold sits in the steel chair in the ring. Slaughter comes out and Stone Cold says, if, if, uh, if Vince doesn't come out in 30 seconds, I'm beating your ass first. And then Vince is in the back. Security then comes down with Pat Patterson. <laughs> Stone Cold says, y'all ain't going to do a damn to God, a damn good thing with, you know, trying to come down here. Ain't going to work. Vince comes down finally. So then breaks Vince's jacket sleeve. And he tells Vince, I'll beat your ass if you don't leave the ring. DX Tyson, it's a big plan. You don't want Stone Cold as champion. Triple H, your ass is here. I'm going to be kicking in your ass tonight. Shawn Michaels, next time you show up, I'm going to keep knocking you down till you don't get up. The Stone Cold said so. So he's sending a message to every motherfucker. He's like, don't fuck with me. Don't screw with me. Um, breaks Vince McMahon's sleeve. Challenges Triple H for a match later on. What do you think? Stone Cold's pissed. I love how uh, Vince wore the most disposable tweed jacket he owned from like 15 years prior. Yeah. When probably. he was still doing interviews for his dad and shit. Yeah. You know, because <laughs> that... I'm like, man, he, that, that that jacket probably costs like $10 at a flea market, you know? He's like, I ain't spending my expensive ones no. on this shit. Yeah. Hey. But I, I enjoyed it. I think um, I think there are times where I, I, I have a different take on Stone Cold as a promo. Like, I think he is – he was a decent promo, but I think he had so much energy and passion in his promos and took his promos – to a different level um it, so i i enjoyed it i enjoyed the energy of it you know who's never wanted to you know talk to their boss that way you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. or break their ten dollar savers um goodwill <laughs> fucking code <laughs> why not yeah um so, but i guess my i so i want to from you then did you have any idea that like this stone cold McMahon thing was going to last as long as it did during this time? Or did you think this was going to be just kind of like a one-off? I thought it was going to be a one-off. I thought they were just doing something, you know, looking, looking back on it and knowing, like I just started reading the dirt sheets at the time, you know, and I thought this was something that they're just trying to get by to give Steve something to do since Sean wasn't going to be like a main character for the upcoming weeks. Um, and I thought this was going to be, I had no idea it was going to end up being, you know, this Vince Austin thing to where a few weeks from now, we're going to see, you know, Vince against Steve on raw in the main event, you know? Yeah. What's weird to me is like how, like, as I go back and watch these, it's always weird how early on to their rivalry they fought. Like, I thought that they were going to fight, like, late, like in, like, September or, like, you know, maybe even August. But they're fighting in April. And you're like, wow. Mm -hmm. okay. um, yeah, so I agree. Stone Cold is very, like, energetic. And that kind of lifted up his, his promos. Next, we have the Quebecers taking on Chainsaw Charlie and Cactus Jack. And... Uh, chainsaw and cactus attack the Quebecers outside. Uh, Jack body slams Pierre onto Chainsaw Charlie and gets a two count. And then Jack slams Cac Chainsaw Charlie's head into the announce table. Cactus Jack takes control and then Chainsaw Charlie misses a moonsault. Pierre nails a hurricane rod off the top rope to Cactus Jack and gets a two count. And then Pierre runs into the post and Cactus Jack lands a double arm DDT and gets the win. After the match, the road dog comes out with a sling, and he says, you two hardcore fossils, this is all your fault. He challenges Cactus Jack to come up. Cactus Jack walks towards the road dog, but then Billy Gunn nails Chainsaw Charlie in the back with a cheer, and uh, then the New Age Outlaws run off. So what did you think of the match, and then what did you think of the Outlaws uh, attacking Chainsaw from behind outsmarting Cactus Jack? So the one thing that stood out to me with this match, you realize this was the only match 
on the card that had an actual like finish <laughs> that wasn't <laughs> a DQ <laughs> or a count out or yeah 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 did these two these four men matter man um I thought I, I I like the I like the whole setup with the outlaws they were really you know setting them up to be you know the top tag team um I just listened to uh the road dogs podcast for the first time and I, I listened to his first two episodes he was talking about the outlaws being formed and stuff like that um they gave them this was right before mania is that time where they started to give uh road dog and billy gun a little bit more creative freedom um and i i think you can honestly say you know on top of the the storyline between lod and the outlaws this rivalry cactus jack and chainsaw charlie put the outlaws on the map even as much as the LOD storyline did. I think it did a bit more than the LOD because I was a kid when it happened and I remember all of this stuff. Like I remember, you know, them coming out with the dumpsters and the lead up to WrestleMania and the actual match and and um, the New Age Outlaws you're right like they kind of had like a weird starting out because they were fighting like you know legion of doom the headbangers you know those basic guys but cactus jack and chainsaw charlie had the wrestling for a bit longer they sort of know their stuff the outlaws are you know they're not babies in the business you know but they're you know still kind of starting out so i think it was a good pairing and it was different too because it gave them that opportunity to be dicks because who yeah. really hates on cactus jack and terry funk you know so uh it was the, the only reason why i put the lod rivalry a little bit ahead of that even at that point nobody had made lod ever look the way that the outlaws made lod look even after that besides themselves i mean they made them this whatever storyline after that you know with the whole you know hawk and his drug use thing that i thought you know that would felt kind of forced uh but i think nobody had ever made LOD look as foolish as the outlaws ever did in that. And I mean, if you think about it, like I'm a, I'm a wrestling historian, LOD were big oh, deals God. in the eighties. You know, they were for a tag team. They, for, in some of those territories, you could put them on a Hulk Hogan level. Um, so that's, that's kind of like, that's, that's like, kind of the reason why yeah. I put it a little bit. bit See, ahead. I've always, for me too, like I've, because again, my viewpoint was, you know, being young, seeing them, I've only seen them in WWE. Yeah. You know, I still, even with the network and stuff, I still haven't seen any of their prior stuff. So for me, like, I know, like my brother was telling me the story of um, them, the, the whole motorcycle incident from SummerSlam 92. Yeah. Hawk and everything. And um, so for me, like, that's pretty much all I hear and know. So, but you're right. If they were as popular, as you say, in the 80s, then that would be a big deal because you're right. I mean, aside from these guys, Legion of Doom and WWE, there was really no one that they, they beat the Godwins, they beat the Headbangers, they beat the, you know, Furnace and LaFon, like they've done, you know, all of those, you know, mm -hmm. um, so I can see it. I can see that. Okay, sir. Well, can Paul Bearer walk down? We get a quick commercial break, and we come back and find the 10-3-21 slam of the week is The Undertaker's return last week on Raw. So Paul Bearer comes out, and he says, Undertaker, you decided to come back. Oh, what a mistake you've made. We did you a favor sending you to the dark side. You could have rested in peace for eternity. Paul then says, Kane has only just begun. Then Undertaker's music comes on and the lights go out. When the lights come back on, the Undertaker is behind them. The lights go back out. Undertaker is not in the ring at all. Paul then says, it's not a game. At WrestleMania, you'll, you'll look at your brother eye to eye you'll, and you'll go back to the dark side, never to return. And then Kane sets off the fire. So what do you think of Undertaker's mind tricks tonight? 
I like the I like this segment. Um, I, I we I wasn't on the when you covered last week's the the previous weeks were raw. raw. Um, I'm gonna say it like when I because I, I watched that the visual like there's not too many things that can physically put me back. Like I I felt like I physically was put back into my like ten year old self, eleven year old. When you walk through the fire, right? Self watching take her walk through that fire yeah. and shit, yeah. you know, I thought it was a great, and I thought this was another, another way. I, th- I felt like this was a kind of an era where you felt the year before you kind of felt like taker was kind of in limbo, mm-hmm. you know, even though he was the WWE champion, it was still, he was still like kind of that corny, like dead man. But I thought this kind of veered more into a seriousness. And even though they're still using like the, the magical powers, which we all knew was bullshit but you still bought into it because it was the way they did it was cool. Yeah. Well, him walking through that fire, I mean, it, God, like I remember seeing that all the time and being like, you know, oh crap, like, you know, him being the casket being set on fire and then them looking at him not being in it. Like I remember all of that crap. So yeah, this definitely, I do think that for me, Undertaker's had a lot of different like good moments and good parts, but this is one of his better parts, I think, in his career is this whole entire undertaker kane saga because this goes on and on and on so it's a it's a good good start and yeah paul bearer looks great here of course um talking for kane all right now we have our next match marvelous mark Miro with sable taking on the artist formerly known as goldust with luna in his corner goldust handcuffs luna to the ring post and sable is handcuffed to the ring post as well uh, Golda sends Miro into the railing and then he sends Mark Miro into the ref, knocking the referee out. Golda nails the curtain call and then <laughs> Golda's leg drops the referee and he grabs the keys for the referee's pocket. Uh, that's when Golda unlocks Luna's handcuffs and then Luna attacks Sable while Luna is still handcuffed and uh, she takes some black lipstick and paints it all over Sable's face. And then she tosses water on Sable's face. So Luna is trying to make Sable look ugly here. What do you think? Mm-hmm. I I like when they when WWE does that. I wish I wish they would take that handcuff spot to another level. Um, I'll go back to a few years ago when uh, they did the Roman Reigns Baron Corbin thing, where they did. Baron Corbin put the dog food and shit yeah. on top of like I get it you want to embarrass him why not give him a beat down on top of that like he's handcuffed where's he gonna go yeah you could do literally do whatever you want why why aren't we like right. logically that's what I would do if I was in that position um I wish there was a little bit more like I know Sable's green she probably can't take the the working punches and let's face it Luna didn't really like her so she probably would have taken some liberties on there so i kind of get that and i thought this this might have been the exception where uh with like it kind of makes sense because it's luna doing it if it was somebody some other female like say it was sunny probably yeah. wouldn't make a whole lot of sense yeah because um, yeah i i i i would have liked to see them kind of make a go to another the next level and kind of you know, abuse her a little bit while she's handcuffed. Cause what, what you going to do handcuffed, you know? Yeah. Yeah. True. Yeah. And that, that's why I think a lot of people sort of like look at Sun, uh, Sunny or God a certain way, because um, I think she was probably like, you said like nervous of what Sable or not Sable, what Luna was going to do. And it's kind of like, well, lady, you're in the wrestling business. Like they're going to take at one point you're going to, they're going to be stiff. Like you're not always going to have, you know, someone be super easy with you. But I remember this, you know, because yeah. I was a big into the uh, mixed tag match at Mania when I was little. I was always, you know, so excited to see what was going to happen. So uh, this I thought was interesting, but I do agree. Like they could have done a bit more with it. Luna could have maybe hit her with her shoe and like, you know, done something or even just pummeled her something. All right. We then get Mike Tyson's interview with Jim Ross. And Tyson says he was pissed off at Stone Cold for flipping him off when he debuted on Raw. Uh, Jim Ross says DX uses people a lot. 
and Mike Tyson says everyone uses everyone. Um, but pretty much as far as winning goes, he's riding with DX. So what did you think when Tyson turned on Oswald, joined DX? What do you think about him defending his reasoning? It made, it made a lot of sense. Uh, people need to understand at this time, Mike Tyson is the biggest combat sports star in the world people in other countries know who Mike Tyson is where people in other countries probably don't know who Shawn Michaels or Steve Austin is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Mike Tyson was the guy. And so it made, it was a big deal when he decided to decide with DX and it kind of fit his personality. Yeah. Uh, his well, perceived I... personality, what everybody thought of him, you know? Yeah. Uh, I thought it was great. It definitely, it, it was a boost uh, for the WWE and the, the logic behind it was great. And I actually enjoyed the the promo and his reasoning that he gave. Iron Mike. Yeah, that's what's funny with about Mike Tyson. Is I knew he who he was, but my first like seeing of him was in WWE. But I knew this dude bit someone's ear off. This is the baddest man on the planet. Like I've seen some boxing stuff, um, but it's cool seeing, you know, him. He was so good though. I felt like with just um, getting involved, like he didn't say much, but like he was good, man. He, he was like a Muhammad Ali. Like he was, a, and that's what I like. I like when the celebrities are fans of it and you can tell which ones are really fans because they, I feel like they add a bit more to it. Like, I think Johnny Knoxville, as much as I hated the match, I do think he was a fan of WWE, which I can respect. I like it when they come. Bad Bunny, I think, is a fan. There are certain wrestlers I feel like I think sort of, you know. But anyways, Mike Tyson's the bomb, man. I want to try his weed. Does he sell weed? Oh, yeah. Okay, I really want to try some of that. That'd be really <laughs> cool. As you can tell by my leaf. Whoa, it just got, there we go. Um. So, moving on, we have our main event, the game Triple H with China, taking on Savio Vega with Los Boricuas. And um, Stone Cold walks down, and he nails a stunner on Jarrell Briscoe, and he hits the referee with a stunner. But then Shawn Michaels shows up from behind and nails a sweet chin music to Austin, and then he delivers punches over Stone Cold. Shawn Such a Michaels, great swerve. Yeah, what'd you think? I love it, but I, admittedly, Shawn Michaels is my all-time favorite wrestler. So even at this point, I was still a Shawn Michaels guy. Yeah. Uh, I, I love it. I thought it was a great swerve. Uh, people legitimately thought that even. HBK wasn't there. Yeah. Um, I thought it was sold well. Um, I love the fact this is the start, you know, Stone Cold coming down and just stunning everybody, everything. I love it. Um, yeah, I thought the I thought the whole segment was good. There's a funny story where my my dad and brother went to see like the they were at the first Raw of '98, the one in New Haven. It was the one where Austin was stunning everyone because they were getting ready for the Rumble, and Austin climbs over the barricade. And at one point, my brother's on the ground, and my dad is still like, Austin, like going all hard trying to like, my fucking poor brother's on the ground, he doesn't give a fuck. He's like, I'm going to meet Austin, man. So uh, that, uh, I, I, can, I can feel that. Austin's one of my favorites for sure. But yes, Shawn Michaels is one of my favorites too. Um, just such a fucking great heel. Because he's like one of those people who like will talk shit to you and smile while he's doing it. And those are like the, those are just like the best sort of like, you know, you can't really stop them, you know? There, there are those that are really good heels, but the reason why Shawn Michaels was a great heel is probably because he was an actual dick in real life. Yeah. Yeah. He was, <laughs> but I love that. Like, yeah. You know, like I, like, I don't like that. Like, I mean, if I was in this situation, I probably wouldn't like it. But I do find it funny that he was able to get away with so much shit. And mm -hmm. you're like, damn. But, 
Yeah. Well, you know, he could sweet chin music someone. That would be it, right? Kind of like, well, yep. well, that was it. What was your favorite moment from this week's Raw? Probably toward the towards the end when uh, Sean came out and swerved everybody. Uh, it's hard to it's hard to top that. You could tell there's a there's a difference between the pacing and what was going on between Raws and ninety eight. Then instead of you know fast forward two years uh, yeah. when kind of everything just turned into a show, they still the. It, like like what we said before, this is uh, very much a tale of two di- different generations yeah. of uh, the WWE, yeah. and go going forward, the, the pacing starts to become different, uh, especially once we start getting hardcore into Austin McMahon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's we're at we're at the point where ninety seven ninety six is still you know majority, and you're right, and then they save some moments that are more like in your face and. Um, I kind of wish again, like I, I don't like it when they have the matches where it's like a one minute match and everybody, you know, but I do, like I say this all the time, everything mattered. What you saw on raw, you saw for a reason. Some of it was filler, but because it was so short and because of the talent, you had to get the best every moment otherwise. And they were competing against another company. Like they had to make it the best so i think even if the matches weren't that great like for me like i feel like they should keep doing it like this everything needs to matter and that's it don't i would i would rather see a three-hour show Mm -hmm. where everything on there tells a good story Mm -hmm. than to see a three-hour show that's just going to have good matches yeah yeah i'm like that too i like i don't like right taking notes while the promos are going but I'm more of a story person. Like the mm-hmm. wrestling is good too. Like I, the wrestling yeah. needs to be good, but you need to have a story to make me care. If I don't care about the match, I'm not going to really invest in it. And there hasn't been a lot of matches I've cared about. Seth Rollins currently, I think is one of the only people that makes me invested in his match yeah. because he tends to friggin' every, you know, rivalry he's had. I can't remember who I heard say this, but they said what what today's talent does that is really off from what the previous generations were is we they used to prioritize the three most important things. And I I think it's kind of been flipped now uh, what those 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 top three most important things. The number one used to be are you drawing money? Number two used to be uh, the story you're telling between the ropes. And number three used to be putting on a good match and sending the crowd home happy. I think it's kind of been flipped to where today's talent is put on a good match, send the crowd home happy, telling the story in the ring. And then kind of the drawing of money falls uh, by the wayside. I think we, if you flip that back over, and I think Seth Rollins does a really good job of this, it, it put, putting the drawing power first. And there's very, very, very few uh, talents in today's uh, professional wrestling scene that are worried about being a draw. They're just worried about the first two things yeah. more than anything. I think, I mean, I've always, and that's another reason why like, I hate spoilers, because if I know, like, for example, if I go on Facebook during a Raw, and I find out that Bobby Lashley is fighting a theory. I truly have no reason to watch, and I don't care. I don't care if the match is great. I have no reason to watch because I know what happened. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think I'm more of a story person because I want to know. I want to know why you're fighting, not just because you're fighting. You can fight anybody. Why are yeah. you fighting him? Um, but, yeah. My favorite moment, I liked um, – Austin ripping the little uh fucking what is it a uh, pocket the pocket like and then the uh pocket. yeah yeah and I also like the Luna and Sable thing because you know how many times do you see two crazy women going at it tying each other up and and writing lipstick on each other? <laughs> listen I live in western Pennsylvania man I see it all the time that's like a normal Friday for you man <laughs> yeah. right a normal Friday at Texas Roadhouse <laughs> um 
Well, we'll be back Monday with our um, next Attitude Years recap. We will be recapping Monday Night Raw from March 17th. They're live in Phoenix, Arizona. It's St. Patrick's Day in 98. Good stuff to cover, man. Good stuff. Well, I want everyone to have a good weekend. Stay safe. Peace in the streets. Make sure you subscribe, like, comment, do all that good stuff. Check out Sharpshooters and Stunners. Subscribe, like. Well, you can't subscribe and give a five star rating. I keep saying subscribe even for like all the like fucking Spotify's and shit. Five star ratings, people. And yes, be safe and we will see y'all soon. Bye, y'all. Peace.